In 1996, the people of Virginia, Brazil, witnessed a UFO event that would change their lives forever. Só que ele planeava e ia perdendo lentamente a altitude e ia caminhando. Call it another Roswell, if you will. It is a crashed vehicle that had beings on board. Mas que eles não poderiam admitir a verdade a população ia entrar em colapso. Nada temos a esconder. Finally, the facts will be revealed. The Virginia case is considered the most well-kept secret in the military circles of Brazil. All right, I'm not going to play the entire intro, uh, nor will I play the entire documentary, which I've now watched. And I went back and watched um, James Fox's first documentary uh, called The Phenomenon which basically documents UFOs and the the phenomenon throughout history when it started the best examples uh good is it morning it's afternoon good afternoon people good morning west coast uh it, i think this might be a part of my childhood that i've actually never or not yet exposed to the world i've always been into fishing i've always been into rocks minerals and fossils and i've always been into UFOs or the idea concept of when i was a kid and you guys may remember you had those scholastic books at school and you'd have to pick your books and I would get fishing books and I would get alien books and Guinness Book World Record stuff like like th that type of stuff. I've always been into it. Uh, never had an encounter. Do not judge people who claim to have had encounters, but I've always loved it. Been fascinated by it. I forget who said it, uh, but someone said, you know, the only thing scarier than uh, life on other planets is if there's no life on other planets. Um, and so this is good. This is amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to Joe Rogan while I'm driving. Where was I driving? It was a long drive. I don't remember when it was. Uh, and I'm listening to James Fox on Joe Rogan talking about stuff that I've loved since my childhood. But, uh, you know, as life progresses, I've gotten more into the fishing, uh, back into the rocks and minerals. But I hadn't gotten back into the, into the UFOs, aliens and those types of things. I love it. Like the famous show goes, I want to believe, and I do believe. But I watched the documentaries, and they're fascinating. Everybody should watch them. And then I reached out to James. He replied, and it's happening, people. Okay, uh, share the link around. We're live now. I'm going to make sure that we are live on all platforms. We should be live on Rumble. Are we? We are. We should be live on Locals. VivaBarnesLaw.Locals.com. Locals, are we live? Okay, it looks like we're live. Okay, uh, now, oh, hold on. I've had this screen up the entire time, people. You haven't been able to see my, my beautiful fatigued face. Okay, James Fox, documentarian, uh, directed, produced. I'm not sure if he produced, but directed. Well, you know what? James is going to explain himself. James, I'm bringing you in in three, two, one. Good morning, sir. Good afternoon. How goes the battle? Thank you so much for having me on. This is uh, it's, it's exciting. It, well, it's exciting for me because, like, I I was I was listening to you on Rogan. I'm listening to the story of Virginia, which I've never I I had never heard of. I had heard Joe talking about it before the podcast with you, and I was like, oh, I really should probably look into that. Hadn't heard it. Ninety four. I was fourteen years old and into other things. Uh, James, okay. Before we get into anything, uh, let's do like the standard thirty thousand foot overview. We'll get into the details and and some new developments, but. Who are you? Where are you from? What did your parents do? How many siblings did you have? And or do you have? And how on earth did you get into the, I say the niche, the career of UFO documentarian? It's crazy, right? So my father was uh, was a was a journalist, Charles Fox, and he had uh, multiple sclerosis. He was diagnosed. He's British. I was born in England, and he was diagnosed. I think at like twenty four years old, and uh, it as you know he had. I guess he had the, the, there was the most chronic version of MS where it basically starts taking your legs out. Then you become a paraplegic and then it moves its way up into your arms. Then you're a quadriplegic and then it, it eventually goes up into your throat and, and you're done. And uh, so I traveled around the world with my father. I was his sort of his uh, secretary. I was his nurse. I was his physical therapist. I was his chauffeur. Um, and uh, he would, pick interesting topics and write for these different magazines. Uh, Rolling Stone, Car and Driver, Automobile, PC Computer Magazine. We got to meet um, theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking a couple of times in England. 
it was really cool because they're both in wheelchairs and they're both doing pretty extraordinary stuff, uh, particularly <laughs> Stephen Hawking and uh, race car race car legend uh, Dan Gurney, and just got to do really cool stuff. And so I was exposed to journalism, I guess, pretty early on as a kid, watching my father do it and interview people, and I was fascinated. Um, then we sort of fast forward. I was in my very actually, I was about twenty years old, and the you know, the digital cameras started becoming popular, you know, the prosumer level cameras where you could grab a camera, go in the field. There was no processing. It was instantaneous playback. And I thought, wow, what a great medium for reporting and, and documenting things. So I got really into that. And I'm giving you, I'm trying to give you the relatively brief overview. Let me just get into a, a little more detail. Born in England, how many years did you live in England before coming to America? A couple years. And then I moved to Brooklyn and I spent a couple years in Brooklyn. All right. And siblings wise, are you an only child? Two sisters, Two older, sisters. older and a younger. My younger is a nurse. My, the, uh, the older was a real estate agent, lives in uh, Colorado. And your mom? My mom's Romanian and she's passed, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay so your dad's a journalist. Yes. You, you've been in America for your conscious life. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Brooklyn. Okay. Amazing. And you grew up with your dad being a and journalist. My mother. Yeah. Back and forth. I would go back and forth from Southern California, Northern California. Oh, they, they, they were, they were divorced. They, they separated. Yeah. They separated when I was like five. Okay. Yeah. Middle child, middle boy of a separated family. Father's a journalist. Okay. Interesting. We have, we, we have some broader context now and all right. So, and, and, and schooling it as a teenager, what, what type of teenager are you? Troublemaker? Pretty, uh, pretty. Oh, uh, I was, you know, I had, I had some issues. <laughs> How old are you, by the way, if I might ask that first? I just turned 50. I actually turned 55 on Joe Rogan's show. Tab out. Happy birthday. Thank and you. You, you carry it well. You look very good. 55. I don't look a day over 54. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit of a troublemaker. You're, are you a troublemaker as a teenager? Where are you growing up? You're growing up in New York as a teenager? Well, uh, no, I grew up in uh, I grew up in kind of in a rural, rural area, a um, place called, well, I don't like to usually give it out, but it's a, it's, 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 it's a fishing community. It's, it's rural. It's about an hour north of, of, of San Francisco, rural, surrounded okay. by millions of acres of open space fishermen, you know, uh, small town, everybody knows everybody. And I would go back and see my mother was down in Los Angeles. So I'd kind of go back and forth. And, um, but I guess I kind of was relatively on my own at an early age because of my father's condition, you know, he, he lost his mobility. And so I, I mean, I was doing stuff at 11, I was driving cars. And I remember doing an interview with this guy, Dan Gurney, I talked about earlier, where I was, God, I couldn't have been 14. Maybe I was 13, 13 or 14. And we're down in Los Angeles and my father could move his upper, his arms for a while and he would drive the car, the, the van with one hand and he'd have the throttle with the other hand, right? So you had the brake and the throttle. But sometimes his, his spasticity levels, particularly because of heat, would get so bad, like he's like, I can't drive. You have to drive. So he puts me behind the wheel of this van. I'm, I'm telling you, I was like 13 or 14. And I'm like, dad, I've driven like in the parking lots. I've driven in you know rural areas. I've never driven on a freeway in Los Angeles before. He goes, it's okay, son. Just keep it between the lines. <laughs> That's what he said. That's I'm driving this van. So we pull up in this parking lot to meet with Dan Gertie. And Dad's looking at my dad and looking at me. He's like, uh, excuse me, Charles, but how old is your son? <laughs> like, Does he have a driver's license? <laughs> yeah that's incredible it, it, your, your dad is still alive no he passed no. unfortunately yeah he and passed. so i mean i i i don't have any life experience with the condition um does it, it ends up taking your essential your breathing function away or you know what happened was it just and my father was a jovial he was an inspiration he was a pleasure to be around he was the he was the light in the room. I mean, he was cracking everybody up. Never pity poor me. He did more things as a quadriplegic than anybody. He actually designed and had built his own portable lifting device. So you could like take it out of a black duffel bag, put it together and then crank the arm and it would lift him out of bed. So people that weren't strong enough to take him in and out of beds or in and out of the wheelchair could have this portable lift. And he was talking to some of the doctors when he was designing it. He was like, why isn't anything like this available? And the doctors was like, well, to be honest with you, Charles, most quadriplegics don't really travel. <laughs> You're going all around the world. And so my father was kind of a pioneer in that respect. And, um, and, and um, 
yeah, he was just a real, he was a real, he was just a real uh, pleasure and inspiration to be around. And ha- it's funny to so tell you this. When I told my father that I was interested in UFOs, I was probably 24. He was just beside himself. I mean, he was like, son, please. He literally said to me, it's a dead end street. There's nothing to it. You're wasting your life. So then he had like our family writing, please talk some sense into James. He's going down this dead end street with this UFO stuff. And they were pleading with me. Your father's very concerned like you. And and um, so the the level of resistance I got in my own family when I first embarked on this journey all those years ago was significant. And um, eventually I, I, I took my father, I finished my first doc by the time I was 28. It's called UFOs, 50 Years of Denial. And I managed to get an interview with Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, uh, six man to walk on the moon, which was impressive. He talked about Roswell and whatnot. And then that led me to another interview I got with uh, with um, uh, uh, William. Uh, sorry, what am, what am I drawing a blank? Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper. And for that interview, normally I would t- my dad would take me to his interviews. But this time I took my father, and that guy was an iconic figure in my father's generation. He was the last American astronaut to go up in space alone. And, you know, he was just very famous. And he talked about this landing case at Edwards Air Force Base, these encounters that he had over Germany in the late 50s. And my father was really moved by that. Like he thought, my God, this guy is not selling his story. He's got everything to lose, nothing to gain. And I think that's when my father started to pay attention. And when my dad died 10 years ago, he was one of my biggest fans. That's amazing. I mean, so you get into it, you're tw- at 24, it becomes a passion. It, as a teenager growing up, it wasn't even on the horizon? No. Funny enough, I dated this girl named Rachel Miller. And um, I was 18. She was 19. And she told me her previous boyfriend was super into UFOs. And I remember thinking, what a freak. Like, I can't believe she would date a guy into UFOs. That's so weird. You know what I mean? Like, I just had this immediate. In fact, we had a friend of the family's who was a pilot. His name was Michael Gardner. And and I would say, like, every couple of years, he'd come over for family, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmases or whatever. He's British. And he would talk about this UFO sighting that he had. It was a pretty damn good UFO sighting. But I was at the dinner table. I remember just like, I'd almost just tune out while he would talk about it. And then, of course, years later, I was like, Michael, can you tell me about your UFO? He's like, well, I've told you five times before. I was like, yeah, but now I'm interested. Like, what, <laughs> what happened, you know? So... <laughs> Uh, did you do you study journalism or what, what did you study in university? Believe it or not, I studied French of all things. <laughs> I speak French. That's like one of my one of my that's one of my few accomplishments in college. Well, that's I mean, we could we could do a portion of this interview in I'm I'm from Quebec, so that's our that's our second language for the Anglophones in, in the province. Yes, but, I know. I, I go up there and I speak French every now and again. And I'm like Very it's funny good. just to like. You know, just to drive from here, just two hours, and everyone's speaking French. It's pretty amazing. It is amazing. It's amazing. Well, it, it, yeah, I'm I'm jealous of the the where you live geographically because it's a beautiful place and and trees and mountains and fresh water and clean cold water, I should say. Yeah. But we got you know winter. We got summer and winter here, so it's 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 beautiful. All right. So so we're contextualizing all this now. Yes. 24, 27. You start getting in. You you'd make the decision to pursue this. Yes. Concretely speaking, what does that decision look like from the day to day? I mean, you have a job, are you 24, 25? You make a decision to go into UFO research. What does that look like as far as your life, your lifestyle goes? Well, it was, it was, you know, I was parking cars, painting houses. I, I, I was a, a, a bellman at a really fancy hotel in Sausalito, which is just across the Golden Gate Bridge. And um, I always, and I remember my sister, she used to say, like, gosh, why are you pursuing these like, these, these day jobs, you should just, it's like, well, it supports me doing what I love to do, you know? And even though I was making docs, but it would take me, like the first doc took me four and a half, four, four and a half years. You know, then I did, then I did it and I sold that to Discovery and it aired on the Learning Channel. And then I made another doc. And every time I finish a doc, I'd always say, that's it. I'm never doing another doc on UFOs ever again. <clears throat> and now I've learned at my ripe old age, not to say that anymore because you, what happens is you do the doc, suddenly more doors open and you've got a better level of access. Now suddenly I'm interviewing some generals or I'm interviewing cosmonauts or I'm interviewing, you know what I mean? And then I did out of the blue 
And out of the blue, I sold to uh, NBC Universal. It broadcasts to a two-hour special on Sci-Fi. Thank you, Larry Landsman. And um, and then I did a revamped version of Out of the Blue, which took me two more years. I mean, every time you finish a, a project, whatever project that is, you have this like when you when you embark on the project, you have this vision of what you think it's going to be. You know what I mean? Like you kind of see it, and then it doesn't always materialize into that vision. And so I always feel dissatisfied every time I finish a film. I finished Fifty Years of Denial, even though I sold it, it did okay. I was dissatisfied. I made Out of the Blue, dissatisfied, sold it, dissatisfied, pay all the money back. Then I did a second version, revamped, spent two more years on it, two and a half years. Yeah, I was happier, but still dissatisfied. Then I did another film called I Know What I Saw, and that was based on an event I did at the National Press Club with a woman named Leslie Kane, who was one of the journalists who broke the secret Pentagon UFO program on the front page of the New York Times in 2017. ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program with Christopher Mellon and, and Lou Elizondo. So we had done an event in 2007 at the National Press Club where we flew in 14 military government officials, FAA officials from seven countries, and I made a movie about it. And I, I, it was pretty compelling, like very high level government officials, a couple of generals, you know, talking about the reality of the UFO phenomenon and, and, and asking the U.S. government to... Um, to open up another Project Blue Book, and that was Project Blue Book was the investigatory arm of the Air Force from 47 to 69. It went through a couple of different names. Ultimately, it was Project Blue Book. Um, and it was terminated in 69 or 70. But to, to open up another UFO investig investigation from the United States Air Force, and we were pushing for that in 2007. Anyway, I made a movie about it. I know what I saw. That took me the better part of five years. I sold that to A and E, and it was a two hour special on the History Channel. I, Again, got, I, gotta, I just gotta stop you there. Like, yes. uh, uh, you, it takes you four and a half years to do your first documentary. This one takes you five. You're living life in the meantime, you're working yes. so that yeah. you can make money to continue financing your passion, which is this documentary. Yes. You edit, I don't know, at night on the weekends, yeah. five years. Yes. How, I'll ask the question you must get asked a lot, but how do you know when it's done? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's such a good question. That's such a good question. I, I think you're like one of two people in my entire career that's asked me that question. You don't really. Usually what happens is you're out of money. You're you're like when I finished the phenomenon, that took me eight years. I started that when I was 43 from concept. I finished it at 52. Like, think about that. No, it's, I, was it's so nuts. Broke. I was so broke at times, I couldn't even afford to pay attention. I remember like just going out into the night sky going, God, please, you know, and you'd think like with the level of success that I'd had previously, I'd been on Larry King nine times, like I'd sold all these other films, like you'd think that it would be easier for me to raise money, right? Well, no, not really. You know, some people would come in, I'd get some investment and then that money would run out and then I'd have to find somebody else. And it was just a constant struggle. Fortunately, I know how to edit. I'm an editor as well as I've done camera work. I've, I've, I do. I still edit my own movies right behind us, because even though I have more money now to pay other editors, I really feel like I can't. I need to do it myself. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe that? I know that, that I I do these like I do short minute legal video breakdowns and like I don't want anybody editing it because a, a change of a phrase can change an entire meaning. Like one one out of context clip or misinterpreted clip can change the entire meaning. Yeah, and 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 artistic theoretical conceptual control over it um so you, you do your own i mean okay sorry i do and here's the thing is i don't do I, I i don't write a script i don't write a script ahead of time people think i'm crazy like how could you not write a script well in the long run yeah it's definitely more time consuming but it's the film will write itself like if you have you go through the content it's a very time consuming process that i do but i found a a, a, a process that works and that is I'll shoot, I'll have an objective. Okay, I want to find out what happened in Brazil. I want to get as many high, credible, compelling eyewitness testimony people as I possibly can. And that's a story in itself, and I won't bore your audience with that whole process. But when I'm done, I go and I color, I watch it all, and I color correct, I color code all the different interviews, and I put them in categories. Like I got Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And then I have levels and different colors 
And what the purple is like, hey, this is really compelling. This needs to get in the film. And then I give them, I raise them up in the timeline. And so I do that. And once that process is done, I organize the whole thing. And then I start putting the film together. And then I stitch the scenes with narr with narration. So it kind of almost writes itself mm -hmm. when I do it that way. A lot of people think I'm crazy. They think it would be a much more streamlined process if I wrote the script ahead of time. But quite honestly, you don't know what you're going to get once you start filming, right? Okay, that's amazing. And, and, and you know, four and a half, five years at the end, other than having to make the decision that it's done either because I feel it is or because it needs to be, you then yeah. decide to sell it. And then you have to you know, decide whether or not it's going to be worth the, 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 the last four and a half, five years of your life. I was, when I finished, when I finished the phenomenon, my son, that's all he'd known when he was born. Daddy's just working on this UFO film. And, and I won't bore your audience again, because there's just, my gosh, I get into it. I, I had just, um, you know, doesn't like towards the end of the movie, we were probably a year out. Th suddenly that whole story was plastered on the front page of the New York times about the secret Pentagon UFO program. Well, that extended the film two years because that came out. I was like, I got to cover that. Right now I got to get interviews with former Senate majority leader, Harry Reid. I got to get interviews with the Intel folks that walked the evidence out of the Pentagon on the front page. I got to interview the New York times. I got to do, you know what I mean? Like, so that just added on. And the, and even if you have investors with money, you can't just keep going back to the well. Like they're like, look, man, you've already asked for this much. You didn't get it done. We can't just keep giving you money. So I'm usually like begging and pleading for money the last, just to get the film across the finishing line. Right? Like it's, it's, and then the phenomenon was going to be in theaters. First time. I was so excited. Like the ink had dried on the contracts. And I'd just been to China two times prior to that because I was filming in China. And I kept the app of the people that I'd been communicating with. And we had translations as well. And they're like, uh, yeah, this, uh, this virus is coming your way. Sit tight. I was like, no, 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 please. <laughs> Because I was going to be released in theaters, right? Just like two weeks before it was released, it, everything started getting shut down. I was like, no! <laughs> although, like, I don't know, although may maybe if it was, on, when it was released digitally, was it pay-per-view or, or, or purchase yeah, on Yeah, so event? anyway, so I'll get to that in a second. I'm dying, man. There's nobody wants this damn thing to go away more than me. I remember my sister calling and she, we were both kind of crying on the phone. I was, she goes, it took a global pandemic to stop you. <laughs> anyway, so so I pivoted to Netflix. Netflix sees the phenomenon and they're like, holy shit. Excuse me, am I allowed to say that? Absolutely. Don't okay, worry. Yeah. They're like, holy shit, this is, a, this is unbelievable. That landing case in Africa is like, wow, right? So were, we want to make this into a Netflix original. So that was a big deal. And they brought in another editor and they're going to put their fingerprints on it. And it was going to be great. They offered a big, big money deal. And I was like a million dollars in debt when I finished that movie. I mean, I just had credit cards maxed out. Ugh. And um, just after a month and a half of negotiations, my distributor accidentally under the cloud of COVID had signed a non-exclusive deal with Discovery. And Discovery would not let us unwind that deal. I offered Discovery. $300,000, their money back, plus $300,000 to just walk away, and they wouldn't do it. So the only option I had left was to go to uh, uh, TVOD, Transactional Download, iTunes, Amazon, Google, Fandango, all these options, right? So we put the film out, like, that's how we released the film, the phenomenon, and uh, it became, I mean, it was a pretty... Pretty big, big success. It became a phenomenon. Huh? But, but big, big, uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> thank I, God, Jesus. Well, I, I can't imagine what it's like. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like being a million dollars in debt. But then you have to make the decision as to how. I mean, you have to make the decision as to how how to get out of it, but also how much it's worth to get out of it. And do you do you do you sell yourself short just to get the short term debt relief? Bird um, in the hand. Is my camera moving? Ah, stupid camera. Hold on, I'm just gonna. All right, so now let's let's get into some let's get into some specifics about uh, UFOs. I'm supposed to ask you about um, somebody named Greer. I'm not sure who he is, Stephen uh -huh. Greer, and I know I'm going to ask you about Tom DeLong because I'm into angels and airwaves and Blink 182, and he's big into the UFO world as well. Offering, you know, he he wants to find the the proof. All right, the UFOs. What, yes. Uh, my the number one question. Everyone should watch the phenomenon. Everyone has to watch Moment of Contact. 
we've been we've been like the world has been fascinated with this for since uh, the 40s. Yes. Rogan has an operating theory or at least it's the lore of aliens that the sighting started after the use of nuclear weapons after World War II and that you know the aliens are coming here to save ourselves. My my retort I always hear that and I always remember thinking like there's a lot of tales of sightings and visits and abductions going back. Some people hypothesize that Jacob's ladder out of the Bible is itself uh, some form of alien interaction. What is the actual history like uh, of, of encounters? What's the earliest documented, for lack of a better word, encounter? And let's get us into some of the best cases. But well, all this underlying, why the hell do we not have any just proper video, proper uh, camera footage, proper photograph, photographic evidence of the of the UFOs. Yes. So <clears throat> there is no question that there was a significant uptick in sightings uh, right after we detonated the first atomic bomb at Trinity site in 1945. In fact, I remember being in the edit room of the phenomenon and during the making of the phenomenon. And I was working with this guy, Lance Mungia. I had a couple of other editors come on board and Lance came up with a really good idea. I'd gotten a hold of these really good archive, like news reports, radio reports, newspaper clippings, all original from a guy named David Marler in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He has one of the biggest archives in civilian within the civilian um, arena. I mean, the guy's amazing. Anyway, and uh, I just put together a little montage of different sightings just to show that these things are happening all over. And my buddy Lance goes, hey, man, we should get a map and put the map up on the editing wall and put pins where these different uh, sightings are occurring. <clears throat> so we did. And I don't know, a couple of weeks into it, we're like, hmm, look at this. This is Socorro here, White Sands, Holloman, Texas. Da, da, da. Look at Trinity. It's right there. Isn't that interesting? I wonder if there's a connection. Like there must be. There must be a connection with the Trinity thing. So anyway, fast forward. Um, I'm interviewing former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, which was a big deal for me. He, he was one of the senators that launched this secret Pentagon UFO program, coincidentally, back in 2007, when Leslie Kane and I were at the National Press Club trying to force the government's hand to reopen. Well, they were doing it secretly at, right around the same time, which is kind of funny. But anyway, so I'm asking Senator Reid, hey, what was one of the more extraordinary aspects of the phenomenon that you guys learned? during this 10 year thing. <clears throat> and he goes, without a moment's hesitation, the connection, the fact that they're coming in over the, these incursions into top secret nuclear facilities, uh, and in some cases shutting our, our nukes off, that was probably one of the most extraordinary aspects. So I went back to the drawing board, I contacted the leading expert, this guy, Robert Hastings, who's written the book on it, uh, UFOs and Nukes. and um, probably spent a year on putting together a 10 minute segment of the film, just uh, kind of highlighting that aspect of the phenomenon. So there's no question there's a connection. Okay, and and flesh that out for those who have not yet seen the phenomenon that a lot of these encounters, a lot yes. and, and people also have to appreciate, like when one refers to a UFO, it's not like necessarily ET green aliens, yeah, for it's sure. unidentified flying objects, which Absolutely. have been in the, in the phenomenon, you have people they're not crazy. They're ex-military guys or they're, they're current military guys yeah. testifying to the fact that there are objects which they had not been able to identify that had um, interactions with, or what's the word I'm looking for, that had an impact on the readiness of nuclear weapons. Yes. And, and they, they don't know how to explain it. It's met, aliens or not, it could be some super amazing Chinese or Russian intelligence. There's a number of people within the community that testified to this credibly, and they're not crazy. Who are some of those people, and what were some of those uh, examples of what they were exp uh, explaining? So, like, there, if you, your audience can can do a Google search for Malmstrom Air Force Base in the 60s. I think it was 66, where you have uh, reports from people on the ground whose job is to secure our nuclear weapons during the height of the Cold War, and report these uh, a disc shaped craft that comes in above uh, the site and then suddenly eight, nine, ten of their nuclear weapons all just shut off, their missiles shut off. And and I interviewed, uh, well, Rob um, Hastings has done extensive research on this. He's written a book on it. I have interviewed a number of these people personally, but I've also researched 
based on the work that Robert Hastings has done and the video testimony that he provided me for the making of the phenomenon. But I did interview a couple of folks, and one in particular was a launch control officer who was at Maelstrom at the time. His name is Robert Salas, Lieutenant Robert Salas. And he said, because I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, this disc's come over. And he, he's like, it's impossible. It shut our, our nukes off. You know, he had all the documentation. And I said, well, what do you make of it? And I'll never forget his, his response. And I could see why he was a launch control officer, because he, had, he was very measured on everything that he said. And he was very calm. His voice was calm. Like this guy could read bedtime stories to your children. <laughs> he had that kind of voice, you know? And he goes, well, James, the way I see it, it's almost like taking matches out of the hands of a baby, you know? It's like, well, maybe we shouldn't be playing with these things. You know what I mean? So anyway, um, and there's countless reports. Minot Air Force Base is, is incredible, but these, these military installations all across the United States, the vast majority of them, we cover, I don't know, 10 or 12 different cases. And even internationally in Russia, we cover that a case in um, Bentwaters, England, Rendlesham Forest case. That was housing nuclear weapons back in December of 1980. And we got the deputy base commander, Colonel Charles Holt, who had his pocket tape recorder out with his man at night, seeing these objects shooting beams of light down into the weapons storage area. You can Google the tape and, and listen to this guy's uh, so voice. I heard the tape. Phenomenal. Uh, by the way, I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to. We're not. It won't change anything on our end. I'm going to go over to Rumble, which is another platform. I'm going to end the YouTube stream, but it doesn't change anything. I'm just going to ask the question here so that everybody knows to go to the Rumble to get the answer. You yeah, I, I heard that part. I heard the recording, and the only thing I'm, I continually ask myself is: these incursions are, you know, uh, occurring, or they're having these these incidents at military bases. Is there no CCTV footage? What explains the fact that there's no video footage, video evidence of any of this happening at the most secure uh, locations anywhere? And with that said, everyone on YouTube, you want to know the answer to that question. If there is one, go on over to Rumble. The link is in the well, comments. All right. 